Um, tonight I want to talk about a topic that is a source of endless fascination for many of us that tune into that uh, radio show on NPR on Saturday evenings, and the topic is why is Minneapolis different from St. Paul? Um, if you uh, listen to Prairie Home Companion, uh, you know that Garrison Keillor is always poking fun at uh, Minneapolis's pretentiousness in contrast to St. Paul where the lifestyle is more laid back and things are more down to earth. Uh, you know, Minneapolis is white bread, St. Paul is rye bread, uh, Minneapolis eats sushi, uh, St. Paul eats brats, uh, Minneapolis consults with its aromatherapist while St. Paul is going bowling. Um, and um, I always get sort of a secret satisfaction about uh, being in on this sort of inside Minneapolis St. Paul thing uh, when folks, I think, outside of Minnesota uh, don't know what this is all about. I mean, to them, it's just one big place, Minneapolis, St. Paul, you know, on the, on the weather map. Um, but the more that I have looked at our local history, the more I'm impressed with how different um, the two cities are. And a good case in point is um, the city elections that we just had this, post, this past fall, both in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, what was the big issue, uh, at least in my part of town, in the city election, whether to vote yes or no on Amendment 168? And what was Amendment 168? Whether to abolish an obscure uh, city agency known as the Board of Estimate and Taxation, which sets the tax levy for the city and its quasi-independent um, park district. Uh, in St. Paul, there was no Amendment 168 because there is no Board of Estimate and Taxation. Uh, the City Council, the Mayor in St. Paul set the tax levy. Uh, there is no Independent Park Board uh, because the park system is uh, a department of city government. So while St. Paul may not be the promised land in terms of urban government, its structure is certainly more straightforward and more coherent than our crazy quilt system. And I see some of you in the audience who know Minneapolis City Government are uh, agreeing with me. Um, so what is the basis for this? And I think this all goes back to 1900 when the two cities both had charter referendums. Uh, in St. Paul, the city leaders uh, came up with a significant but somewhat modest proposal to consolidate uh, the power of the mayor, uh, it moved St. Paul forward, not a dramatic change, uh, and that um, referendum was approved by the voters of St. Paul, and it gave St. Paul home rule, which meant that St. Paul on its own could uh, change its uh, governmental structure. Before then, uh, major cities had to go to the legislature to change structure. Minneapolis came up with a very dramatic uh, plan that would have uh, vastly changed city government, overreaching, some said, would have uh, taken power away from the council, consolidated in the mayor, and uh, come up with a uh, very uh, different strong mayor system. And in Minneapolis that same year, in 1900, the uh, Minneapolis Charter Plan uh, failed. And here is a cartoon, a uh, little St. Paul saying, uh, oops, wrong way saying, my mama got me a new charter. Oh, I guess my dad is out. Uh, a halo over her head. And here's little bare butt Minneapolis saying, I wish my mama would give me one too. <laughs> um, so why the differences between uh, the two cities? Why did uh, St. Paul approve its uh, charter in 1900 and Minneapolis defeat its charter? And I think these next two cartoons uh, point that out very well. Here are uh, the voters of St. Paul working together to move the charter stream, uh, the charter uh, down the street. And here in uh, Minneapolis are the charter opponents throwing rotten eggs and vegetables uh, at its charter. And I think um, in St. Paul there was clearly civic unity in 1900. Uh, the people of St. Paul did work together to. Um, pass a charter, while in uh, Minneapolis there was a lot of divisiveness. Uh, the city council, of course, didn't want to see their power uh, diminished, and uh, they had allies in the labor movement who felt that uh, the labor, the fledgling labor movement had much more leverage with the strong council than with the mayor. So this dynamic of the council and labor movement opposing 
um, charter reform continued while St. Paul was uh, approving uh, one charter change after another. Uh, Minneapolis tried over and over again to approve a new charter in 1904, 1906, 1907, 1913, and each time uh, the charter proposal failed. Um, and finally, in 1920, uh, so that Minneapolis could get home rule, which is what St. Paul had 20 years earlier, uh, the Charter Commission merely codified, uh, pulled together the existing sort of complicated crazy quilt system uh, into a charter amendment and uh, so, so that uh, the city could achieve home rule, but uh, the 1920 plan didn't really significantly alter the structure. And basically, we're pretty close to living with that system uh, still today. Uh, St. Paul changed. Uh, they went to a commissioner form in uh, 1970. They easily moved back to um, a strong mayor system. But in Minneapolis, uh, through the 60s into the 80s, uh, charter change did not happen. In uh, the late 1980s, then Mayor Don Fraser did get a modest proposal through which which shifted the balance of power um, towards the mayor to some, to some extent. Uh, but uh, charter uh, politics has continued to be contentious, interestingly enough. The proposal on the ballot in November to abolish the Board of Taxation uh, did not pass. Once again, uh, charter change uh, failed here. Uh, so why did Minneapolis and St. Paul move on such widely differing paths uh, over the 20th century? Uh, I think that um, I'd like to draw at this point on an analysis that another historian, Mary Wingard, came up with. She's written a very interesting book called Claiming the City, Politics, Faith, and the Power of Place in St. Paul. A very interesting book, and if you're a history buff like I am, um, I'd strongly um, suggest you, you read it. Uh, her last name is spelled W-I-N-G-E-R-D. And while uh, Mary doesn't deal directly with charter politics, I think that her analysis certainly does impact on that issue. Uh, she points out that at the turn of the last century, the economies of the two cities were diverging uh, quite substantially. St. Paul had been an important commercial center. It had uh, been uh, at the center of a network of trade throughout the Midwest. But by 1900, Minneapolis was pulling ahead. It was becoming the milling capital uh, of uh, the country, and uh, St. Paul was lagging uh, behind substantially. Uh, the um, manufacturing sector was lagging in St. Paul, and uh, Minneapolis's population, of course, at that time had uh, begun to surpass St. Paul. So uh, Winger uh, says, faced with these hard facts, St. Paul's civic leaders were forced to discard metropolitan aspirations and focus their energies on a defensive strategy to keep the city's position from eroding further, a project that would require interclass event investment in civic loyalty. Boosterism was redirected at a new audience, the residents of St. Paul, in a campaign to turn the city's liabilities into virtues. Smaller was better. St. Paul, unlike its rival across the river, cared about its citizens. St. Paul was not a heartless machine. It was a community. The bonds of community then logically demanded that St. Paulites patronize local businesses, support the Democratic Party, and keep their dollars and votes out of the grasping hands of Minneapolis. Uh, the other side of uh, community accountability uh, required businesses to make considerable concessions to um, its working class residents. Both business and labor had much to gain from such a pact, and they worked together to construct a fortress of localism that would engage St. Paulites across class and ethnic differences in common loyalty to the city. Now that was quite different from the situation in, in Minneapolis where uh, the milling and manufacturing uh, companies that powered the economy here served a national rather than a local market. Uh, uh, these industries, um, and of course this was uh, one of the key here, the Washburn Crosby Mill that was located on this site, uh, these industries depended on a large-scale industrial workforce whose members shared few common bonds with their employers. Uh, the corridors of power uh, remained the exclusive province of the old stock families. 
And all this fostered economic and social priorities quite unlike those of St. Paul. And I think even in geography, and not to sort of overplay this analysis, uh, where do the rich people live in, in St. Paul? They lived along Summit Avenue, and uh, within a few blocks of Summit Avenue, there were more modest homes, and so there was at least some, some geographical mixing. In Minneapolis, the rich people all lived out by the lakes, along Lake of the Isles. They were cut off from the rest of the city, very separate, very exclusive, and uh, this uh, certainly uh, fostered uh, uh, this, this, this elitism. As we'll talk about in just a few minutes, this certainly spilled over into labor relations. St. Paul was relatively peaceful. Uh, Minneapolis had a history of very divisive, very violent uh, labor relations, at least up through the World War II era. Uh, Minneapolis has uh, differed from St. Paul in uh, another important respect, and that has to do with the darker side of local government, municipal corruption. Now, while St. Paul uh, skirts are not completely clean, uh, St. Paul certainly had its uh, corrupt issues in the 1930s. Uh, it was known as a haven for gangsters from out of town. If you uh, came to St. Paul and uh, you uh, spread a few dollars around City Hall, uh, the police would lay low. If you wanted to do bad stuff, you had to go to Roseville and Lauderdale. But as long as you stayed in St. Paul, the police didn't bother you. But uh, nothing in St. Paul could equal the breadth and audacity of a corruption scandal that swept through City Hall in 1901 and 1902. And here is uh, Minneapolis in the cesspool of municipal corruption. And here is city government over here. The legend is, uh, did she jump or was she pushed in? And this little box right here is a ballot box because it was, in fact, the election of 1900 that ushered in this era of uh, corruption. Um, ironically, if the Charter Amendment in 1900 had passed, it would have substantially increased uh, the power of the mayor, who was at the center of this corruption scandal, and would have made this corruption scandal even worse. Um, as it was, the corruption scandal, uh, right after the turn of the century, brought Minneapolis some very unwanted national notoriety. Uh, the scandal was written up by a muckraking journalist named Lincoln Steffens. Uh, in an article known as The Shame of Minneapolis uh, in uh, McClure's Magazine. And this is the cover. Now,